As editor-in-chief of Package Design Magazine, I speak with some of the most brilliant thought leaders in the design, branding, and marketing of consumer packaged goods. Through the generous support of our sponsors, we bring these experiences to you. This video series explores what inspires these thought leaders and their insights on the collaborative design process as a strategic business competence. I'm Linda Casey, and this is Package Design Matters. Hi, I'm Sarah Palumba, Senior Client Director at Product Ventures, a brand strategy and design consultancy specializing in packaging innovation. Welcome to the second webcast in the Package Design Matters web series. Today we hear from Barry Calpino, Vice President of Breakthrough Innovation at Kraft Foods Group, and Peter Borowski, Head of Design at Kraft Foods Group. Their team has done some great work, including the category-changing Neo, as well as the introduction of P3 Protein Snack Packs. Please welcome Barry Calpino and Peter Borowski. Can you tell our audience a little bit about your role at Kraft and how the two of you work together? I lead uh, innovation for Kraft across uh, all of our business units. Uh, and we work across all the different uh, units of Kraft on all of our innovation work that we do uh, across the company. And <clears throat> since design is such a, a fundamental core element of our playbook on innovation, Peter and I work very, very closely together. Yeah, similar actually. Um, I'm very much connected to all of the functions across the uh, organization and uh, work very closely with Barry on innovation. And at Kraft, what we're doing is we're bringing in design earlier on in the process. So uh, Barry and I have been playing um, and working very closely together. At the intersection of due diligence and creativity is effective design. It requires a clear picture of the consumer, mapping the right strategy and consideration of all the senses. It also takes attention to detail, precision and craftsmanship. Effective design makes a difference. Design matters. And what role does design play at Kraft and, and you know, innovation as far as product development as well and package development? Um, well, design, I think, you know, plays a role. In fact, actually, for a long time, design at Kraft was seen as execution. And I always say gift wrap. And um, recently, uh, design has actually played a more important role where it's involved a lot earlier on in the process when it comes to kind of brainstorming, innovation, thinking, new ideas. So really getting involved earlier on in the process and working with Barry and his team uh, to really work on innovative ideas and concepts. Yeah, I think, I think the big headline is, is that we've totally shifted the uh, where design fits. And so it usually, it used to be a back-end executional step. We've brought it up front as a very, very fundamental core strategic element of the innovation process. And we've said to all the teams across the company, this is so important to your success or failure. You need to think about it and really invest time in it really early on in the process and engage Peter and all the other uh, leaders across the company and the outside agencies we work with early and give it the right attention that it deserves. And it's, and it's had a big impact uh, on our results. Yeah, and I think it's, um, it's about talking, you know, it's, it's talking about design strategically, and I think that's the difference. Um, so it's really kind of bringing in that strategic mind set, um, that strategic vision um, into the process, and I think that's what's really needed, um, and that's what's made a difference. 
Brand narration and visual translation is a keystone service of product ventures that grounds design in a clear strategic vision before putting pen to paper. True to the saying of picture speaks a thousand words, we identify what needs to be said and how best to say it visually so that we can most effectively resonate with the consumer. By leveraging design in this thoughtful manner, we make the most of the precious few seconds at shelf by communicating the brand and product proposition in a resounding way that is not only aesthetically desirable, but also strategically aligned. Yeah, and definitely part of being strategic is, you know, bringing it early and also working across the teams, as you had mentioned, Barry. So, you know, how do you work across the team? There's, there's, there's the formal and the informal. So on, on the formal uh, piece, um, we're accountable for the, the, the kind of the craft ways of working and processes and playbook and so and training and teaching. So formally, we're, we're, we're using process, we're using teaching, we're using training to help drive an earlier emphasis on design. Informally, we work with all the teams across the company, um, and it's all about our ability to have influence and impact via the credibility that we bring, via the experiences that we have from where we've worked before we came to craft, um, and, our, and our ability to get out and make those connections, whether it's with our customer teams, our agencies, uh, down to the junior marketer who's working on a new project, uh, Everyone has an influence uh, on design. Yeah, and I think it's really, um, it, it is about getting out there and within the company and, and really preaching about design and design thinking. So part of it is really educating, um, you know, craft employees about the importance of design, you know, design as a business tool, um, and then really educating them on how design can be actually um, used you know within the process and the benefits of design so I think there's a lot of preaching a lot of education uh, we have a lot of educational programs that we put on um, I play a role in that in really educating you know our um, you know our teams on design and the value of design and, and that's really made a big impact Barry, I have to ask, what does success look like at Kraft? I'll, g I'll give you two specific examples, and, and it just embodies what we're, what we're trying to uh, constantly teach and, and help the teams with. We have a, a, our Oscar Meyer business has a big new launch this year called P3, and it's a, a protein snacking project, and it's a big, big launch. And what we, we, we spent time with the Oscar Meyer team and said, your packaging design and structure is going to be critical to establishing this whole idea and make it one of your earliest and most important things you work on in the life of the project. And they moved it way up. And they did much, much more thoughtful work than they would have done downstream. The result is a fantastic package from a, both a functional standpoint, but also from an impact standpoint at the shelf. And the launch is off to a really, really good start as a result, because they put that thoughtful uh, effort into it early. Uh, another one which we're probably most proud of is this uh, the Mio business, which Peter worked on, where we were creating an entirely new category, and we felt that the package itself would have to help communicate and convey and establish this was an entirely new brand and an entirely new category and an entirely new behavior for consumers. Big, ambitious uh, project, but it's led to a... a more than a $200 million new brand that's won every innovation award that you can think of. And the package work that they did up front, again, with the team, uh, is one of the top three reasons why Mio broke through uh, during, its, uh, during its launch. When we were actually working on Mio, you know, it wasn't working, we weren't working on a package design, we were working on a brand. We were actually building and developing a brand. And uh, the important thing about innovation in design is that you, what we did actually on Mio was to say, let's go in 
and create this category, but actually kind of do something very different. So the packaging strategy was to go in there, appeal to a millennial, and go out with something very breakthrough. Um, so I think from an innovation standpoint, I think we kind of, you know, hit a 10 or 11, as Barry would say, on all, <laughs> um, you know, aspects where I think the design innovation alone um, really is just remarkable in a sense that it doesn't kind of fo follow any category norms, um, i.e. fruit on a package, you know, your, your obvious cues. So I think we really kind of did a good job there in, in you know, really presenting something very different to the consumer. Neo definitely is a very good example of building a brand versus just a package design. I mean, everything from the name, which, you know, which actually describes the use of the product and the packaging and having this kind of holistic development. And that's something that I know, Peter, we've had discussions about holistic design and development and how important it is not to break out package design. I think, um, you know, when you think about design holistically, um, uh, well, as a brand holistically, I, I think what, we, what we've done here is we've actually introduced brand architecture as, as a great guidelines and document that really helps with, you know, design communication. Um, it's important when you're building a brand to create consistency. Um, consistency, unifying elements that hold the brand together, um, differentiating elements that basically help communicate the uh, different product offerings. So for Mio, you know, you have your base, you have your Mio fit, and you have your Mio Energy. And you know, brand architecture has really helped us to really establish a look and feel, um, but also really to create design language that helps consumers shop and navigate um, in store. So Peter, we talk about Mio, you talk about uh, the product differentiation and the different lines. That naturally brings up the idea of brand extension and how important brand extension is. And I understand that you mentioned the craft has done some wonderful brand extensions. Gary. Yeah, I mean, we love to talk about Mio, obviously, because it's 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 one it's such a iconic uh, example of of everything that we we talk about inside the company. But the reality is that Kraft, uh, our number one point of uh, competitive advantage, is all the brands that we have. So. Uh, our 90 percent of our innovation is always going to be leveraging the equities that we currently own. Th those are our crown jewels. So um, the ability to take those brands and smartly and wisely and strategically and thoughtfully extend them um, is at the absolute core of what we do as a company. And if doing that well is going to make all these brands bigger and bigger and stronger than they currently are. Um, there's so many examples of companies that haven't done this well because they don't, they don't respect the brands that they own uh, and they focus too much on the specific project. You know, there's so many examples we could share with you. The one that I love the most is what we've done with Kool-Aid and going into liquid concentrate is that everything that makes Kool-Aid great is uh, on steroids on that little package and it, it actually celebrates why Kool-Aid is such a great brand in a little tiny package. It's even shaped like a, a pitcher of Kool-Aid. Um, and then we have this brand that's been around forever called Velveeta, which uh, people thought was a dead, old, nostalgic gathering dust. Uh, and we've brought it back to life as a company. And if you look across Velveeta skillets, all the different uh, products that we've launched, the ability to just celebrate what's great about that brand as we extend it it makes the brand stronger. And when you extend it poorly, it actually hurts the brand. But when you do it well, uh, there's nothing better because then your core business gets stronger and your extensions uh, grow the business. And that's so true, Peter. You know, you think um, with a company like Kraft, of course you are lucky and it is extremely fun to work with all these wonderful brands that so many of us have grown up with. But at the same time, it is a lot harder to do design, fresh design and innovation at a company like Kraft with so many brand equities versus maybe a, smart, a startup, which doesn't have to worry about that as much. I, I, I disagree. I, I think that what you, what you need to do is you need to leverage them in the sense that you need to stretch your equities. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think it's holding us back. I, I think that you need to be creative in how you apply them. Um, how you use them um, and I, I feel that really it's actually something that's incredibly valuable don't don't obviously take advantage of them but I think you can leverage them and push them and that no other brand can do that you know no other brand owns the equities that we have I don't think it's restricting us or holding us back at all how do you work with outside agencies to keep that innovation engine rolling 
Um, I think you've got to inspire them. Um, the important thing is that um, what we do here is we really inspire the agencies. So um, obviously the credit strategy brief um, is a way to kind of, you know, writing a good brief obviously gets you uh, to a good place. But I think personally being involved, um, you know, along the way, uh, really being engaged in the initiative and the work, um, and really, I think, brainstorming with them on, on new ideas and, and concepts, that, that's kind of, I think, led to a lot of our success, is, is real kind of full engagement on an initiative. And Barry, you know, that's got to play a huge role in the breakthrough part of innovation. Well, it all goes back to what we talked about before, is that any agency will tell you, and I'm sure Peter's gotten this feedback numerous times, you bring us in early and you set very, very high expectations for us, nothing nothing will get you better work out of an agency. If you bring an agency in at the very, very end on the back end and tell them execute, you're going to get exactly out of it what you expect. So what we have found is the earlier we bring in agencies and, and the better uh, they make such a huge impact. And they've the impact they make often goes beyond the specific uh, task they've been hired to do. Because when you're in the room at the early stages, really great people can't help themselves but to give you more ideas beyond even their sphere of uh, functional expertise. And we've seen that recently on a number of big innovation projects. Yeah, and we talk about, you know, design partnership, you know, agency partnership. Mm -hmm. And it really has to be a partnership and it really truly is a partnership at Craft. Um, because, you know, to get to great work, you want them to be involved earlier. So it's really that kind of partnership from day one on, on starting with them on the initiative, um, you know, gets us to a great place. And it's a partnership, again, with expectations that are set and set pretty high. How do you judge and evaluate an agency's work? Well, a lot of, a lot of ways, um, you know, but there, a lot, all the ways we judge them, there's, there's still no substitute for the consumer evaluating them. And so one of the things we're very mindful of is, we're, you know, it, while we loved, we love innovation, we love marketing, we love our brands. We're almost never the target uh, consumer for our brands. So, uh, part of the cultural change at Craft is we've, 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 we've made sure that all of our designs get on front of the consumer and get validated by the consumer in a real live store type setting, so that we're not just talking to ourselves and how much we love our work. Nothing gets us more excited than when the consumer loves our work. <laughs> That's the ultimate uh, thumbs up for either one of us. Yeah, and I think, um, again, you know, when, you, when you're evaluating design work, um, you've, I think you should always have your brand foundations in front of you. You should have your creative strategy brief in front of you. And, you know, you should have that consumer in mind. And a lot of times, you know, we, um, we actually, in, in some of our presentations, you know, we remind everyone, you are not the consumer. So do not evaluate the work based on your opinion. You know, you have to put yourself in the shoes of that consumer. So sometimes even before the process of getting designs in front, right. you know, mock-ups in front of consumers, um, even at the earlier stage, we're saying, you know, just remind yourself you're not the consumer. You know, understand what that consumer's looking at. What we've actually done that's worked really well is uh, on a lot of big projects, we've done a quick audit, and it's a visual audit. And the audit, uh, for example, on... Um, and say maybe it may be a, a tween brand. Uh, we've actually gone and done a visual audit that basically shows um, how tweens or what tweens are buying. You know what what kind of um, uh, products they're buying, um, what kind of you know uh, products they're interested in, um, and it's really kind of a visual audit that kind of shows you what these products look like. And what we do is that we present that to the actual cross-functional team before a presentation, and that gets everyone in the frame of mind of a, of a consumer, um, of that particular consumer. And that's worked out really, really well. So the visual kind of tool just to help them understand what is this consumer buying. For those in our audience who want to someday lead a design or innovation group, what's the best advice you can give them? I would say be prepared. Um, I think being prepared really gets you ready for that challenge. Um, the other thing actually is take more risks. Um, in my career, I've, I've always taken risks and they've paid off. I always say calculated risks, okay? Uh, from the business standpoint, uh, what I learned early in my career, I give this advice all the time to new people, is to never stop 
paying attention uh, outside the office, whether you're in the grocery store, you're watching TV, you're walking down the street, is to always pay attention and always look for ideas and insights everywhere you go. Because typically, the, the best ideas always come uh, unplanned, and they come when you least expect them. And so when you're out and about, pay attention, number one. Inside the company, uh, I had advice earlier in my career, which I give now to a lot of new, really strong people that we hire, uh, and it goes back to some training I received early in my career on a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, which is a classic book, but the one habit of the seven that successful people have the least, I have found, it's called Seek First to Understand. Because we are surrounded by so many talented people. So if I'm with Peter or, or anyone I meet, uh, I'm usually the one who asks the questions and listens versus talking about myself. And uh, people who come in uh, early in their career, they like to do most of the talking versus the listening. So I always give people the advice, uh, seek first to understand. And if you keep that uh, in your hip pocket, you're going to be uh, ahead of the curve. And there's someone that I'm mentoring right now at the company and she gave me feedback that since she focused on that she's had this profound uh, change in all of her uh, interactions with other people on her team because she's now listening to them. Barry I read an article that's talked about how you're using like this awareness of people's bandwidth to make sure that the projects that are happening are of high quality. How important is editing the number of projects? Oh my god it's um it's counterintuitive, right? Because so many of us are trained that to prove our value, it's more important for Peter to say, I've got 100 projects or I've got 50 projects versus to say, I only have five. But, you know, you do the math, $500 million launches is the same business for Kraft as a hundred five million dollar launches and when we when i started in this role at craft we had a hundred five million dollar new product launches and i said why don't we just have five hundred million dollar launches so if i can take all the talent in the company against a few really big ideas and make them great get the design thinking early um, it's very very powerful in fact in fact in a big organization the power of reducing, focusing on a few really big opportunities and putting all the talent against those few opportunities is unbelievably powerful. The Mio example we always use, we put a team on Mio before the launch and we told them, stop doing everything else in your job except for make Mio and create the new business. Uh, and they all had day jobs and they stopped, their day jobs were cut out and they were 100% focused on Mio. Well, not a coincidence that Mio was a huge success. So the power of, of focus, the expression I use a lot is less is more. And we actually found that our new product revenues are double what they were four years ago uh, with less new, product, uh, new products launched than when we were half the size. But doing something like that really requires buy-in from the C-suite. Yes, yes. Well, our CEO, uh, Tony Vernon, it, it, it's one of his religious mantras, too. So when we talked about fewer, bigger, better, uh, we were sp both speaking from the same hymnal. We were both uh, to probably taught this at some point in our lives, and this was our chance to to make it happen in a big company. And uh, it's one of those concepts that everybody will talk about. But, but to do it is not easy. It requires a, a lot of senior management support. It's very easy to get caught in this, I'm good because I have 100 projects versus, no, no, no. I have three great high-impact projects versus 100 low-impact projects. All the big launches we've had in the last four years are, are the output of that way of thinking. And, and what we've tried to do, to your point, is how do you get that in a big company? You've got to measure it, track it, evangelize it, reinforce it constantly. So we, we're always measuring, um, are we working on too many projects? How big are the projects we're working on? Uh, are we, are we, are we, do we have the right number of big projects versus small ones? So if I look at all the big home runs we've had in the last three years, Javalia Coffee, the K-Cups, Mio, uh, all, the, all the liquid concentrates, Oscar Mayer Selects, Lunchables Uploaded, Velveeta Skillets, all the mac and cheese growth. Those are all examples of what we said, let's get focused on big ideas, big brands, and take super talented people like Peter and, and, and the agencies we work with and say, let's make these big ideas bigger 
versus let's try to launch 100 small things uh, weekly or, or in a mediocre way. And Barrett, you kind of touched on this before, but where are your ideas coming from? Where, what inspires you? Where do ideas come from? Um, they come from too many places to answer. I, I'm, I'm not the type of person who has like one or two ways. I would tell you in my, in my career, the number one place ideas hit me is walking around uh, stores and grocery stores. So whenever we hire a new marketer, I'll be like, the cheapest, simplest way to, to, to stay connected is just, just w once a week walk around the store. Uh, and as I always remind people, uh, it's also free. <laughs> we spent a lot of money on research here at Kraft, and as all CPG companies do, you can walk into a grocery store and see every new product, every category, uh, and they don't charge you uh, to walk in. To build on what Barry said, you know, definitely grocery stores are the place, but don't stay in your right. category. Break out of your category and walk around and see what other brands, what other categories yes. are doing. And that actually is not just for two-dimensional design, yeah. that's also for three-dimensional design structure. And so we do that, you know, we encourage that, we push the agencies to do that, and I think that's how we kind of get to some really great yeah. thinking. I'll give you an example, and, I, and it's, we have to disguise what it is. We're, we have a big new product launch coming out uh, in about six months in the beverages team where Peter and the marketing team, the inspiration behind what made the package uh, a home run came from uh, toilet bowl cleaners. So they were looking at toilet bowl cleaners in the grocery store. And that was the inspiration to, to get a, a, a beverage project where frankly we'd been stuck for a very long time. And the solution came from walking the store looking at, t mm -hmm. who would ever look at toilet bowl cleaners uh, for a beverage idea? Well, Peter and the team did. Um, I can't tell you what it is, uh, but when it comes out, we'd be happy to, to share it with you. And I would love to hear about how you pass on your knowledge and your experience and mentor others in the industry. Yeah, it's, it's probably one of the most important things we do because, again, think of Kraft as a a huge company and Peter and I cannot be involved in every project, but anyone we can touch, influence, mentor, and inspire, then that's a legacy of what we're passing on and that, and they take that energy into their uh, daily work. So um, I mentor a lot of people at Kraft. We're, Kraft, uh, we've made recruiting a big part of our new company points of emphasis, so I do a lot of work on campus and I teach a lot of classes at the business schools who we hire from. So it's it's a double win. Because one, I get to pass on what I know to the students, but two, some of those students end up coming uh, to work uh, here at Kraft. And Peter's done the same thing, where they walk in the door and they'll talk about things they heard us talk about in their school. And then they bring that to the work that they do. And there's probably nothing more rewarding when you're in a role like this than to realize you've you've had a real big impact on somebody who's incredibly talented uh, earlier in their career, who, by the way, lead many of the big projects that we have here in the company. What I think works really well is that when you um, a critique in work, you should always explain what you're saying, what you're doing, what this means. You know, And I think a lot of times if you're educating people why, and let me tell you why I think this, that helps because what you're doing along the way is that kind of slow education, that education is informing people, making them better at what they do, but better actually understand what you do and what your function does. So I think, you know, constant education in meetings and presentations is very important and has actually worked very well for craft. And I love how that complements what Barry said earlier. You're saying always be teaching and Barry mentioned earlier as advice to younger uh, younger designers and innovators is always be learning. So always be teaching and always be learning. What great advice. Well, again, we're a team and, you know, we basically are helping each other. You know, it's not, a, it's not about competition. It's about everyone supporting each other and everyone helping because at the end of the day, we just have one, you know, goal. So. <laughs>